Hi everyone and welcome to week 14. We're going to be talking about big data, what big data is, and how big data can be used. So first off we want to talk about what is big data. So big data is a common term that you'll see where we are talking about extraordinarily large collections of data. While it can be structured, unstructured, or semi-structured, that can depend on sort of how it's being stored, the type of data that we're storing, and what we plan to do with it. Now, when we're talking about big data, just so that you have an idea of scale, we've seen some examples where maybe we have 100 records or 1,000 records, and we could very reasonably put those into a spreadsheet and work with it there. However, spreadsheets are not the answer to everything, as we've seen previously. If we have more data and it's structured data, we may want to put it into a relational database as a better way to save it so that it is able to be worked with a little bit easier. Relational databases, remember, can have hundreds of thousands of items. Now, that being said, it's getting more and more common where the data that we're talking about is literal gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes of data about people, behaviors, activities, records, logs, anything like that. And because big data can be structured, unstructured, or semi-structured, we have to work with it differently. These data stores or data sets are literally so large that they can't be handled traditionally. So people had to come up with different tools, different techniques, different ways of working with this data because it was just literally so large that it could not work with the things that we already had. Big data is not only extremely large data sets, but it's also data that grows really quickly. We'll see big data being used for things like predictive modeling, AI, machine learning, and some other things that you've probably been seeing in the news a lot. Why big data is important. Um, I would just like to take a moment and have everybody appreciate that I actually did not use data memes in this entire PowerPoint. I was very judicious about using them. You're welcome. It hurts. So big data is important because Technically, you can make better choices if you have more data. The more data that you have, the better you can see patterns and the more intricate patterns that you're able to see. Big data gives us the ability to do some real-time data analytics. So real-time data collection, real-time data analytics means that we can have our choices. We can do all of our work a lot faster. It also means that we have the ability to automate more of it because a lot of times when we're talking about big data, we're literally talking about data sets and data stores that are so large, there is no possible way for a human to deal with it in any way. And so there has to be computers that are dealing with all of the analysis, saving, organizing, programs, algorithm usage, like computers have to do all of that. People can't. And there's no way around that. So the more that you're using big data, the more that you have to automate things because it's really not possible for people to try to do that. Um, there's been some cases of people trying to have humans do this and it hasn't gone well. Um, there's actually in the news currently a case with a very well-known retailer that was trying to trial some basically like machine learning algorithms to figure out what you were buying from the store so that you didn't have to do a checkout. So normally when you go to the store, like the grocery store, you pick up all of your groceries, you go to a checkout aisle, uh, somebody scans them, you pay and leave. Then there's also the option of self-checkout where you scan all of your own items and then you pay and leave. Well, what they were actually trying to do was use machine learning and image recognition so that you could pick up your items as you go through the store and then you could just walk out and they would charge you later. And it turns out that while they said that they were using big data and image recognition and all of these fancy buzzwords to do it, um, 
that was actually not at all true and they just paid a bunch of people very very low wages to do it so that's actually currently in the process of failing because that's not sustainable or scalable the more data you have the more data you collect the better you can tailor your business so the more data and information that you have the sort of more you can drill down into what you know and what you can do with what you know now with big data there's something called the v's of big data so this was coined a little while ago but you'll probably see this um, in a lot of the resources where when we talk about big data we're talking about volume high volume of data much data velocity the speed of the data being generated so fast and variety such variety many sources of data so these are generally what we're going to see when we're talking about big data whole bunch of data coming in quick and there's a lot of sources of it it was kind of the tldr for that now some examples of big data being used advertisements is actually a really common way of big data being used because advertisements are trying to pick things that you need and maybe you didn't know you need or you're interested in and it maybe wasn't something that you were doing before you know one of the things that they found about a lot of consumer patterns is people tend to buy the things they find familiar and whether this is you know what you had growing up or a formative part of your life people tend to stick to that and there are very few times where you'll go away from that so if you happen to buy a particular brand of bread um, you'll probably keep buying that brand of bread because that's you know what you're used to or a particular brand of um, garbage bags you know you're gonna keep buying those because because that's what you're used to so a lot of advertisements will actually try to use big data and a lot of different behavioral methods. It's really not just what have you been searching for. It's what have you been searching for? What time of year is it? What have you been interested in? What have you been seeing previously in your ads? What have your friends been seeing in their ads? What are your friends interested in? Because sort of psychologically all of those make a big difference for the things that you may have the possibility of purchasing another example of big data being used is actually a lot of the routing software so like Google Maps Waze anything like that they'll use real-time traffic which is big data that's that's a lot of data coming in when you think of the amount of cars that are in the world um, and so that type of on-the-fly decision-making would use big data you know is this the best route to take is this not quite as fast because there's cars is there a traffic jam is there a police officer in the road is there an accident is there bad weather is there an object in the road you know they've started looking at some of those things and so that's all that real-time traffic is all big data because it's going to be looking at things like GPS coordinates and how many cars are in the area and how fast they're going and what does this usually look like and what's the average time, all of those things. Fraud detection is also an example of big data being used. Fraud detection for banks and credit cards is actually really big business. Um, when you have banks and credit cards, it's in their best interest to detect fraud as soon as possible. If you have a bank or and a debit card, if fraud is detected and you lose money, they have to reimburse you for it. Now, there is a slight difference between like a debit card and a credit card in that the fraud has to be proved and then they reimburse you if it's a debit card, whereas with a credit card, you can say, actually, this was fraud, this wasn't me. They'll reimburse you, and then they'll go off and they'll do their fraud investigation, and you don't really hear from them again. So fraud detection for banks and credit cards basically ends up meaning lost money for them. And as expected, people no like lose money. So whatever they can do so that they can detect fraud quicker, um, any variety of fraud detection, behavior, patterns, historical behavior, anything that they can use for that so that they can figure out is this transaction fraud kind of in the minute that it's happening, they're trying to do.
Another example is predicting weather. Um, any variety of natural systems, early storm warning systems, um, you know, nor'easters, snow, rain, anything like that, they are using big data to do these predictions. They're looking at all of these weather models from historical data, cloud cover, temperature, wind, humidity, and because storms and weather is a global phenomenon, it, you have to look at sort of what's happening everywhere, which is a lot of data to be collecting. Big data needs different tools. The ability to handle that kind of data with real-time visualizations and a variety of interactive anything needs specialized tools. We need special kind of data storage that's bigger than we might have had before. It means that we require more places to store it, more places to back it up, more people to take care of it, more people to take care of the backups, and more security for the systems. Because, you know, we're not talking about a 4 gig USB anymore. We're talking about, you know, petabytes of data, multiple petabyte drives or multiple drives that are going to equal petabytes, terabytes, things like that. And so being able to deal with that volume needs different tools and languages. So some tools that we'll use. Um, some of the really popular ones are going to be uh, Hadoop. So Hadoop will give you the ability to store and process data. It's open source and it uses distributed computing. Um, it's not too bad to use. It just, it has a little bit of a learning curve, but if you don't enjoy programming, you probably won't enjoy Hadoop. Um, Apache Spark is a newer one. Um, so Apache Spark is still popular open source um, and is actually starting to take over from Hadoop. Hadoop was really popular like maybe 10 years ago-ish, um, but Apache Spark has been coming up on it and is a little bit more popular right now. Um, one of the things that makes it a little bit more popular is it gives you the ability to work with your data using other languages, so it actually has APIs for other languages. Um, the reason that this makes it more popular is because Different data scientists will have preferences for which language they are most comfortable writing their programs in. And so if they have the ability to write their programs in their language of comfort and then use an API to interact with Apache Spark, um, that's probably going to make them a lot happier. So Splunk is another really popular option. It's a data analytics tool. If you're in the IT degree at NECO, you'll be seeing that in Linux Admin. Um, and basically the idea is it allows you to handle big data, but it also allows you to work with dashboards, visualizations, and incorporates AI. Dashboards are kind of like websites that you can go to and you can see your data in different ways and you can use your programming knowledge to create different things to pay attention to. So like if you're looking at your data and you have particular data points or pieces of information that you're looking for or things that you want to pay attention to for whatever reason, you can basically set up your own little widget to pay attention to that. Tableau is also really popular. That's a data visualization tool. Um, it's very popular with companies and it's basically, you can do a whole bunch of different types of charts, but it allows you to drag and drop. So one of the reasons that Tableau ends up being super popular with companies is because you don't really have to have tech knowledge to do it. Whereas with Splunk, I would say you, you need to have a little bit more of a tech background to use it reasonably. Not a lot, um, and I don't think either one is particularly difficult to use, but if you, you know, have never done any programming before, Tableau might be a little bit easier for you, which is why it's popular for companies that want to hand it to, you know, people in a more business-focused area instead of a tech-focused area. I'd also like to note, this is not an exhaustive list. These are some examples. Um, I ended up picking these because these are ones that um, I've tried, I've used, I've seen in industry, and I happen to know are really, really popular. Um, but there's a whole bunch more out there. These are just some that you may end up seeing. Now, big data is not the same necessarily as the databases we've been talking about. 
The databases that we've been talking about are relational databases. So we've been talking about databases that are made of tables and the tables have relationships to each other. NoSQL databases are able to handle bigger data pools by default. So big data we can actually store in data lakes, raw data, data warehouses, process data, or data marts, uh, data warehouses for specific purposes. Data warehouses or marts can be databases, but it does end up needing a schema so that we can figure out what data we actually have and kind of have a map of that. Data lakes can be anything. It can be web logs, it can be social media, it could be sensor data, it could be literally any data anywhere from anything. And that type of data, because it's unstructured data, wouldn't go into a relational database easily. It would have to go into a different type of database, like a NoSQL database. Now, database scalability. When we talk about scalability, what we're talking about is how gracefully you can work with larger amounts of data or more information coming in. So let's say, for example, we're going from 100 users to 1,000 users. How gracefully we can do that without having to worry about downtime, redoing tools, rewriting our code base, things like that, that's the sort of small time scalability. Scalability also means going from 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million. Can we have our tools and our setup work just as well for 100 people as a million people? So one of the things that we'll see is that's actually kind of a hard thing to do. So we'll sometimes have to use different tools or different methods to be able to make it so that we can work with larger data sets, more customers, just basically more. An example of this. So if everybody remembers from the earlier relational databases, relational databases will generally have IDs, primary keys um, and foreign keys from previous. So most of the records will have, well, all of the records will have an ID. When it ends up getting added to the database, the record has to have an ID so that we are able to access it again. We have to have the unique ID, the primary key for the table. Now, um, we can have IDs that are going to be just like plain numbers. You know, this is record one, record two, record three, record four, whatever. However, if we're talking about a database that's, you know, 100,000 records, but only one person works on it, we can do that record one, record two, record three, semi-reasonably. It's not unreasonable for that to end up happening, even if there were, let's say, two people working on it because they could coordinate with each other. However, let's say that we have a 5,000 person company, we have several people that are working with the database, we have lots of people and programs that are adding entries to the database, that's going to break really fast. So that is no longer going to be scalable, which is why we're going to use GUIDs. We can use a GUID, which is going to give an ID number in a very different way. You can see the example of that in a previous week. And those GUIDs will make it so that that database is now able to be used by basically as many people or programs as we want. We don't have to worry about multiple people manipulating the data. So there are some trade-offs um, to make sure the database is working correctly. Traditional relational databases, um, the best way I can say it is they fall over. If you try to use them for big data, they just kind of go like, no, and then pfft. Whereas we could use NoSQL. NoSQL is the way that we can make some of these trade-offs. And if we're using NoSQL, it doesn't have the same issues. Now, some problems with big data. So one of the issues with big data is lack of talent or skills. It's really hard to find people that know how to use these tools, um, are able to do the analytics, have the skill sets required to be able to go in and work on this. Um, so having the experience, having the skills, it's short supply, which means it, 
is expensive. So trying to get enough people and pay them is an expensive endeavor. Scalability is also a problem for infrastructure weaknesses. So one of the things that we talk about in industry is tech debt. And tech debt is basically the concept of people putting things together and going, oh my goodness, this is not working, but I can patch it really quick. It's okay. I'll take care of it later. And whenever a tech person says, I'll take care of it later, um, that's, that's where we have tech debt. And that can come and smack you in the face if you aren't careful with it. And big data will make that come and smack you in the face, but like bad. So you have to be careful how much you have and scalability the ability to go gracefully and grow gracefully um that is really where you see a lot of weaknesses come up the infrastructure weaknesses the code weaknesses the code review weaknesses the testing weaknesses scalability is where you're going to see all of those chickens come home to roost um, another issue that we have with big data is quality not all data is good data. We can collect data we shouldn't for different reasons. Like maybe we didn't really need it. Maybe this is personal. Maybe we're just, you know, we just shouldn't have it. Like we're not the right people for that, whatever. Some data isn't helpful. Um, the more data you have, the more data you have to organize, the more data you have to work with. And then it's also correlation is in causation and people can see patterns and want to see patterns that aren't necessarily there. The more data you have, the bigger the target on your back, the more valuable you, your data is. Because if a hacker can get in and get that data, the more you have, the more it's worth. Now, where big data might be going next? More streaming in real time. So processing it in a stream instead of in batches so that you can get real time analytics, real time information. Um, AI and machine learning for more automated decisions is something that we're sort of seeing more of now. There's obviously quite a bit of controversy about this one. If you see anything in the news, you'll probably see a lot of arguments about like, you know, AI is taking my job and, um, you know, so many of these people are just using AI to do their jobs. Anyway, AI and machine learning and automating a lot more things is another place where big data is going to be getting used more. Um, the democratization of data, basically more people having more access to their data, remove their data, um, and big data being used to facilitate that. Another th thing that we're seeing is more no code and low code solutions. Now, it is important to know when we say no code, low code, that doesn't mean that nobody has done the code. It just means that the person using it isn't necessarily doing the coding. So that's where it's basically somebody else did the coding and now we're reaping the benefits. So if we can have AI and ML come in and help out with some of these solutions, we might have the ability to make tools that more people can use. So less background knowledge will be required for them. So it's like if you can have some coding, but it makes the coding easier to write because somebody handled something in the background and then they're able to use some AI and ML to be able to help the decision making, you know, maybe they can make it sort of a lower barrier of entry. If anybody's done any programming, you know that it's not always the easiest thing to sort of pick up on the fly. And so these no code, low code, AI, ML supported solutions is one of the things that people are starting to sort of think about, look about, and try. Because people that really know what they're doing in the tech industry with experience, especially in some of these hot button areas like AI, ML, big data, data analytics, um, stuff like that, they're so expensive to hire. And so companies don't like spending that money and they're trying to find ways around spending that money. So that's the end of big data. I hope you are all having a lovely day.